Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to have a session which is primarily discussion, is my goal. And I am a co investigator on a project called Information Management Framework for Environmental Digital Twins. And our goal is to build that framework around how you build twins, how you can en enable inter interoperability. And we're reaching a point now where we've got uh, key points to get feedback on. So I'm gonna, we're going to, we've got some session goals. So these are our goals. So I kind of want to go through a session where we, we can actually make the case for interoperability across twins. I think a lot of that's been here today, so some might be quite brief. I um, want to explore use cases for interoperability, because that's key for future work and where we go and the direction we're going to set. Um, get some feedback on what we found in the project. So I'm going to show a very brief synopsis of what the project has found in terms of recommendations to the community. I want to get some feedback to feed that back into the project and move things forward. And also potentially garner interest, and who's interested in going further with this, and what steps to go next. Because at the moment in these projects, we're working on kind of an annual basis or a six-monthly basis in terms of funding. That means we know what the priorities are, and we also need to build the teams each time to make sure we get the most value out of each, each of these projects. So the way we're going to kind of look at this and kind of go through this, um, I'm kind of given a very brief introduction. I've got one slide on a few use cases. But then I'm going to hand over to Benjamin Ford and, and James Byrne, and they're going to show real use cases that they actually look at in terms of interoperability across twins and where they're at at the moment. It's still very much work that's in progress. So some of this is ambition, some of this is where we're going, some of this is things that we're looking at. Then I'm going to show you a bit on the IMFE project, where we've kind of come from, and kind of go into those kind of stakeholder outcomes to kind of set the scene for discussion. And then we're going to go to what I'm hoping is a really good kind of hybrid panel virtual discussion. Uh, Jonathan and I are going to effectively, we're going to put some questions to the panel, then we're going to open it up to hybrid to get more input, and we're going to iterate through the questions, because I'm keen it's not kind of a one-way thing on one side, I want it to be a proper hybrid discussion to actually bring us to a close. And that should hopefully be a good 30 minutes. So this is the one slide I've got to introduce kind of the why. This came out one of the first projects I was, we did. And we're looking at actually use case-based development of an information management framework, and I'll cover what that is. And we had three use cases. So we had the Met Office with a model called 3DT, which is effectively a dispersion model used for things like instant response when there's pollutants in the air. Um, we had the work that James is going to present on Antarctic Twins, um, beautiful work um, on effectively ships versus sea ice models and, and Antarctica models. And then, we had land, and then we had the CEH land insight models. And that's effectively uh, looking at soil moisture um, which fits very neatly with the work that Ben's going to show. And also soil carbon, which fits things like the International Plan for Climate Change. So there's got high impact science on there. But we found that you'd need different interoperability across different twins. You need potentially need discovery of assets and, and elements in them. The data between them would potentially exchange. If you look at wind force and of sea ice, potentially you've met office to pass. Um, the processes and services, the tools you're using within those twins to do your predict predictive work. And the tools and visualization need to be shared. But you don't need all those elements across all twins. There's a key concept which came out. We look at something called a narrow middle, which I'll introduce very briefly later on. Um, so the interoperability is not across everything. And I think the key thing here is if you do 100% of the work, you're going to get 5% of value. We need to focus on those use cases and where we get the most value from interoperability. So I'm going to hand over now to, uh, it's, not, it's not changing. There we go, James, to look at the bass use cases. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you very much, Justin. So, um, yeah, so I'm here to present some uh, use cases for digital twin interoperability from the British Antarctic Survey. Uh, I'm a research software engineer there, and I'm a co-investigator with Justin on the IMFE. Um, so, first off, I'll start, why do we need digital solutions? Well, I mean, I think we're all very aware that we need to really quantify and look at how the uh, Antarctic and polar environments are behaving in response to driving forces. Um, in order to do this, we need to look at the deeply integrated processes and systems that happen in those environments, uh, and they may well be human as well as uh, environmental. To do this, we have lots of data and tools, like weight, and that we've been collecting that for a very, very long time. Uh, so we've de developed significant capabilities to study the environment and all of those processes. Some of these influence the environment, in particular things like ships, submersibles, planes, 
um, and also the presence of humans down there as well. Um, but, and some of these actually uh, form part of global observation networks, so that's quite an important thing because it actually opens up those data and tools to other analyses. So the capabilities are under constant innovation and development uh, at BAS. We uh, do an awful lot with AI, we do an awful lot with uh, Earth, and, um, Earth observation and telecommunications and survey work. Um, this research quite often goes into production very quickly as well, so it becomes part of our operational capacity as well. So with that in mind, we need to be able to transition research, research uh, into operational systems quite easily. Why bring AI and digital twins to environmental research? Well, there should be lots of bubbles on this slide, but there are, in fact, not many bubbles on this slide. Oh, no, there they appear. Um, so we have lots of use cases. It's all about what-if lines of inquiry. I'm glad to press the button there. It's all about these what-if lines of inquiry with digital twins. We have to ask integrated questions and get integrated answers that collect data from all of the different forms of observation and data that we have access to. Um, this drives the efficiency of our operation and the efficiency of science, and it aids responsible discovery in the polar regions. Uh, digital, twif digital twins, by their very nature, offer quick, direct feedback into operations as well. So as we ask these integrated questions, get answers back, then we can start to feed into our operation and make it better for the environment. So, what environmental impacts do we explore? Well, we, target, we can target, for example, operational capacity. So we can start to look at, with AI, we can look at where we, place, we are placing sensors. We can look at minimizing our, uh, our, minimizing our impact on the environment. So a very big program at the moment is all about route planning of polar vessels for research purposes. We also aid conservation activities in the polar regions as well to really assess how we're actually impacting the environment. I'm not clicking the button enough, apologies. There we go. Um, so, final slide, what does interoperability mean for all of this? Well, interoperability is the keystone to asking those integrated questions and getting uh, integrated answers back about what we're doing. Our aim is to produce a twin of a continent in the long term, and to do this we really have to have a consistent platform by which we're taking research, or doing the research, and then turning it into operational systems. We can't do that ad hoc every single time, so we, this is where things like the IMFE are really helping us to develop that sense of responsible uh, interoperability. I shall now hang, hand on to Ben. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. So, hi everyone. Thanks for giving me a bit of time to chat about this stuff. <clears throat> oh, it's the big green button, is it? Is that what I need? It's the big green button. Fantastic. So, so yeah, network rail, railways, integrated transport, intelligent mobility, all this, all this good stuff. Uh, what are we doing there? So, at the heart of the railway, well, so there are three things. There are three reasons why this is important. One is resilience uh, versus efficiency, which is the key key trade-off that digital twins helps with. Uh, another way is, one is enabling intelligent mobility uh, and integrating the future transport zones. That's another key thing that digital twins can do for us. And the third thing is uh, optimizing things better, uh, doing better optimization and optimizing for better things. Both, both sides of that coin. So those are the three things I think that are most, most critical in digital twins, the kind of the so what's for us. So I'd start by, by looking at this, and this is, this is sort of the, the four-way trade-off that's at the, at the heart of the railway, if you like. Uh, well, what, what do we try and do? We try and deliver as much capacity as we can uh, at as low a cost as possible. Uh, broadly speaking, we have to deal with reliability. We want it to be nice and reliable for you. And for a long time, we got away with uh, trading these things off and actually giving you better on all three of these things by reducing, uh, sorry, increasing journey times a little bit, because that works, yeah? That works, until it got, until, you know, a couple of minutes people didn't notice. Once it got to about five minutes, people started asking the question, why is it taking me longer to get from Manchester to Leeds now than it used to? So all of a sudden we couldn't do that anymore. Uh, so we're still now <laughs> stuck with these trade-offs. So how can we make better trade-offs? What can Digital Twin do to help us? So we can have more responsive speed controls. So that's around two things, that's around traffic flow, managing traffic. So we can, we can run trains closer together, so it gives us a, a benefit of capacity against reliability, because we can be more responsive when things aren't going quite how they should. Uh, we can also use that to respond to 
uh, from a reliability perspective to geotechnical risks, which is when we come back to the, the soil and moisture twins that, that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, that ability to respond to weather events in much more in real time so we can manage our assets more efficiently. Rapid optimization, so yeah, more, 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 more quick adjustment of timetable plans to a response to conditions. The ability to adopt digital signaling is the big one in many ways that will un unlock a whole load of capacity without building new bits of track. We'll be able to put trains closer together um, and all that good stuff. So, so there's, a, there's a bunch of opportunities here. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, this is a, a very high level view of a whole lot of things. You know, the, these trails exist in many, many forms across the asset management world, across the operational management world, and across the infrastructure construction and development world. So but that, that's, that's the heart of the railway. Intelligent mobility then is the other really important. Hello. Uh, the other really important shift uh, that we need to make happen in the railway because nobody's nobody's journey starts and ends on, starts and ends on a train. Nobody lives in people don't live in train stations generally. So we need to move with the times. We need to get intermodal uh, intermodal transport needs to become easier, more seamless, all that, all that good stuff that I'm sure you've heard people talking about today already. But this is kind of my vision of what that future needs to look like. Uh, we need to get closer and closer to the customer, have much more clear insight around what the customer really wants so that, you know, if they're trying to get home for the big game and it's all going wrong, you know, actually their, their little handheld device will understand what they really want uh, and help them do the best thing. Um, so their requests will flow down and we need to manage the network in a way that works across modes and provides options but also provides nudges back so that Digital Twins will let us have a, a feedback and feed forward system. So the the choices of passengers become part of how we manage the system when things aren't going as well as they should, uh, and let's deliver capacity. So that's, that's sort of the second thing that we can't, we can't do this without a digital twin, without a good digital twin environment that lets us handle the kind of data and manage uh, just the level of complexity that this, this requires. And the third thing then is to, you know, like I said, optimization, better optimization. So at the moment we manage the railway to, to things like this, and we end up with this dizzying array of percentages that. You know, I'm not quite sure how 17% achievement of a target of 80% amounts to 73%. I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, so we end up with these kind of complex systems. And, and they, they exist for good reasons, and, 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 and that's fine. I, I shouldn't be too disparaging about them. Um, but they are proxies for the things we'd really like to measure. Uh, and in the end, well, we use the five, the, sort of the five case model to, to build business cases to invest in infrastructure, why, why wouldn't we use a five case model for any decision, really, if we could? And Digital Twins can let us get closer to that. They can let us quickly do that analysis, bring the data to bear, and make decisions that actually are best overall for economy and society um, in closer and closer to real time. So we can use them to define timetables. We can start to use them to choose which train to prioritize during disruption even, maybe. So that's, that's the journey I think we're on. Uh, so yeah, that way we can max, maximize sort of taxpayers, taxpayers' value, uh, and also manage end-to-end -end journeys for people, which at the moment, you know, we aren't doing that. So that's my so what. So I think that's kind of my final thought on the matter, really. You know, it's how, it's how all these bits work together. And in the railway, we've, we've tended to think far too much about our little bit of it. And that's partially because the, the data and the systems don't let us do more than that in the ways we really need to. So we done. So, thank you. Um, hopefully that's planting some seeds for questions. If you've got questions, come in, get them on Slido, and we'll start picking them up later on. Um, and if you want an idea of how it works by phones, just take an iPhone to America, go to a big American city, and just watch it take over your life based on what's your Gmail and other things. It's incredible. Um, it blew my mind. So. I'm going to kind of, before we go into the discussion, just show you a little bit on the Information Management Framework project. Just kind of set the scene, get to those recommendations, act as primers for that discussion. Because um, one of the things we're keen as we move the discussion on, we to actually take the lessons from this project and learn from those. And this is a project that actually spanned five agencies across different environmental domains in the National Environment Research Council. So you've seen a little bit from myself from the National Geography Centre, you've seen from James. We also had CEH for the, hydro, um, the terrestrial side, BGS for geological, and STFC who gave us the atmospheric and the infrastructure side. So it's far more than just one organization. And I'm going to leave the top of the slide as is. I think that's been covered to death. But I think the key thing to cover here is around what is an information management framework. 
And that, that is what we're trying to build in this project. And on the, the does, does it have a pointer? It does. So on, on the right hand side, you can see we've got this picture about how we want to build this. Um, we actually want to develop this in an agile way, and that gives you an idea of all the components. But a key thing about this information management framework is about establishing a shared vision on digital twins. Um, developing a conceptual framework as to how we can develop them in a way that actually allows us to make them interoperate. Agreeing and implementing the digital commons. This digital commons effectively gives us a narrow middle. It allows us to actually scope and actually narrow down that interoperability to something that's achievable as opposed to trying to achieve the entire interoperability piece. Um, delivering demonstrators. So uh, demonstrators are key to this. We need to show that it works. As my uh, RPI that actually created this project, he wants the digital twin he can kick the tires off to prove that it works and actually continue this work. And developing the components of digital twins as well. So one of the key things that we've done in the project one at the moment is, to, is develop asset commons. I'll cover that in a second and what that really means. So the first project we, we ran was last year. And we, we were, it was a scoping study around what does an information management framework look like. And effectively had a top down versus bottom up. So we had effectively what was the Center for Digital Built Britain and the environmental landscape as kind of our top down drivers. And at the bottom, we had kind of the elements that came out of the Center for Digital Built Britain, so the foundation data model, reference data library, integration architecture, governance. Um, and then we had these three use cases that I showed you right at the beginning of the session. And we kind of, we, cried, we smashed all these together, had a few meetings where we had kind of the online boards, because it was kind of come out COVID, couldn't really meet at that time. And we actually produced a model and a roadmap. And at the moment, we're turning that model into a paper which should go in for review, hopefully this month or next month, depending on how fast we go. And the link for that is there if you're curious. It's got about 15 or 16 key recommendations as to how to build twins following this. We then moved on. And so the way we're being funded at the moment is kind of six to 12 months projects. It's quick, it's fast, and every 12 months we have to kind of renew our ideas. And this is the second project in one slide. Um, we've got big part of stakeholder engagement. That's what I'm gonna show you in a second in terms of the, the kind of the, the senior stakeholders. Um, in the middle, we've got kind of what we've done, so the generalizable IMFE. That's that paper with the narrow, the, 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 data, the asset commons and the data commons. We've got a development framework, and we've got a Hague Fresh pilot study. We'll cover that in a second. And our outputs will be a framework. That's this paper that we're working on. Very much follows the digital commons concepts and developing a narrow middle. To, and then we've got IFME, so IMFE services. And the key thing we're going to see from that is they're developing something that we call an asset register. With hindsight today, asset, we need a name that's a bit more meaningful than asset register to people. But essentially, what, what we mean asset register it's a, it's, a reader, it's a description of a digital twin that a human can read and a system can read. So it's machine actionable and kind of human actionable. It covers what's in the twin, how to interact with that twin, what that does, what the context is, what the scientific value of that data that come out is so that you know if you're taking data from that twin, it is good for your use case or it may be good for your use case. So effectively, it's a, it's a big description of a twin and it's based on a data catalog in our, in our first example. And we should have, uh, within a month or two, we should have an example which people can see on that and explore as well. And the other one we've developed is we've been developing our asset that John would like us to get tires of, which is our Hague Frost twin. If you've really got good eyes, you should be able to see a lobster pincer somewhere in the pictures on the right hand side. So this is about Hague Frass. It's a marine protected area off the southwest of the UK. Um, we need to monitor it um, as part of our obligations in the UK. And we are using um, large autonomous vehicles. So you saw in James's slide, there was a yellow submarine thing you saw. We've got one of those. It's about this long with cameras on the bottom. And it's got an endurance of a few weeks. Um, you set it on, on fixed lines. It takes pictures of the bottom. And it generates millions of images. Those millions of images are going into our kind of template twin, which we could build on a twin. And then we're going to be building services on top of that to identify those species within there and effectively do the census of what you're seeing in the marine protected area, which in future work can then potentially be used to kind of optimize future missions and, and, go, and do bit different elements of research. Um, I think that's everything I want to say on there. So another key element is the stakeholder forum. And that, this is the primer for that discussion we're about to go into. 
So in the first project, we formed an initial stakeholder community of senior stakeholders, the span the research councils, government, industry. Um, and they gave us, um, they, they were there to kind of guide us and give us insight and recommendations of the work to make sure we get the most impact. Um, we got, um, so key people at the Met Office were there, the research councils were there, um, government agencies were there, good examples. And it was chaired by Chief Science of the Met Office and uh, effectively looked at existing projects and then potentially where we go next. And this next slide is the one which I'd all like you to have a look at very closely, so I'm going to leave it on there for a little while. And this is their key recommendations. So this has come out of two workshops that we've run with them. And we've, we've condensed hours and hours of recordings into this single slide of key recommendations from them. So the first one is that interoperability is a central challenge. Imposing standards may not be possible. And that's key. So when you look at, I don't know if anybody in the room is familiar or online is familiar with the concept of fair data. Fair data is a way to make it kind of useful for the world. But if you look at different communities, they all have different interpretation of fair which means those communities wed themselves to a certain set of standards, and that's what worked in their community, and that's, they're the standards they go for, go, tend to go forward with. So the key, key element in there is how do you build that bridge between them without necessarily telling them that one group they've got to change what they're doing. Um, but through a common applications, a common standards may emerge, and that's this ISO date thing that was discussed earlier. And Pilot IFME Asset Register is a good step forward. So this asset register, which describes our twin, is a first attempt at trying to describe what a twin looks like. We know it's not the final answer. We know it'll iterate and it'll evolve, and we know there's future versions needed, but we just want to pilot something to actually show what's possible. Using these should be direct priorities. Environmental twins have the greatest value as decision-making tools, as decision-making tool for policymakers. This is our, our stakeholders telling us that they want to make decisions with them. They want actionable information coming from those twins. Small and fast is better than big and slow. So they want us to develop components quickly, which is why we're doing an asset register very quickly. It's why we're doing a Hague Press Twin very quickly. It's effectively developing those piece by piece rather than trying to do all 15 recommendations at once. Community practice needs to enable safe spaces for fail fast innovation. So a key piece of work we're working on is community practice. And we're currently going through discussions with Turin at the moment as to where we go with this. So the community practice work that's coming out of the IMFE project will likely fall into the Turin in some shape or form to be seen how that works because I've got the meetings over the next two weeks to see what's going to happen there. And we need a federated approach across communities. So we need to get across different groups. There's beautiful use cases out there. We're going to come to kind of a use cases question where you can potentially bind things like the built environment, the marine environment, if you look at things like wind farms. An ongoing stakeholder mapping is required at both national and global level. I've been going to meetings and conferences for a year on this. My stakeholder map is just growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Everybody's kind of following this type of route of twins. So they're the key recommendations. I'd like to have a think about those because that's going to be one of the key questions we come up with. Um, we're looking for feedback on those and gaps people think are there or, or whether they would like to go further with them. And a few acknowledgements. Um, I would like to... Perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> my goal is 25 minutes for this whole section. We did well. Um, so I'd like to introduce the panel. And then what we're going to do with this is we've got us some seed questions, but I'm open to any questions from the audience and any questions online. So we're going to kind of go to the panel for a question, then we're going to open it up to get some feedback on Slido. And then we'll move on to the next question, because I'd like it to be a truly hybrid kind of interactive discussion. So we're going to go... Um, so if you've got stuff you want to raise uh, online, please go to Slido so we can actually see it. We'll make sure it gets fed in. Uh, but for the moment, I would like us to introduce our panel. So if our panel members would like to take a seat, please. I'm sorry about the spotlights. It's a little bit warm for you guys. <laughs> um. So... I'm going to give me each a, ch a chance to a few science centres to introduce himself. So I think we'll go from left to right. So Cindy, go for it. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sindhu Manikam from uh, Digital Catapult. I'm a senior industrial IT technologist there. I'm a part of Digital Twin Working Group at Digital Catapult, and I'm handling digitalization practices and framework for energy and manufacturing industries. 
Thank you. I'm Anasol Peña Rios. I'm part of BT Group. I'm a distinguished engineer and research manager in the research and networks strategy area. Um, I lead research in how we can use digital twins for specific use cases for uh, BT Group. And I focus as well on what digital twins mean for uh, or different stakeholders within the group. I think we've got the, uh, the old... Uh, yeah, we're OK. Um, okay. I'm James Byrne from British Antarctic Survey. So you've just heard me speak. Uh, I'm co i with Justin on the IMFE project. Uh, my role on that project specifically is to challenge the IMFE uh, with respect to the batch use cases. So we wanted to make sure that all of the department, uh, the different element divisions of NERC were challenging the use case. Cool. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Ben Ford. I work for Rail, sadly, uh, today. I don't feel great about it, in it with, with the way things are going, but that's OK. Is it, is it just me? Does it not like me? Oh, is that, that, now it's there. That's the next problem. <laughs> right, OK. Um, so, yeah, so I, I work for Rail for my sins. Um, we're in an interesting time at the moment, and Digital Twins can hopefully help us solve some of our, some of our bigger problems uh, going forward. And, uh, yeah, I, I work in the operations world trying to drive innovation and, and, uh, and technology and get us into the 21st century. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so, going to start some questions. So, the first question, I know I've, we gave the panel um, the, all of the feedback from the senior stakeholders before this, they've had a chance to prepare. Um, the first question we kind of got for the panel, and then we'll kind of we'll go to Slido, is do you have any kind of initial feedback and thoughts on the senior stakeholder feedback, and, and do, you, do you think there's any gaps, or do you think there's more? Or, or do you, and we will start with James, because he's looking at me most oh, I was looking at my phone, you see. I've got the <laughs> stakeholder recommendations on there. I can go back a few slides if that helps. Yeah, that might be good. It'll be good, yeah. There we go. So, yeah, I mean, I do have some feedback on it, actually. I think, um, as you said, the asset register is, is quite an important thing that we've, we've discussed uh, f at great length. And, uh, and you mentioned the thin middle as well. And I think the point with interoperability, as I alluded to in the slides, is that you need to have a template for building components. And then you need to think about, well, we've definitely discussed, one of the really important things is having clear use cases for your twin. So if you create a twin, it needs to have a use case. And then we're using this asset register, and that's not, the use of that's not clear. But actually, that's where you're recording the fact that the twin exists at all. And after that, you can then start to talk about interoperability with different twins, with different use cases, all shoved into this asset register. And then you say, well, that's not a thin middle. And it's like, well, you can't have a completely non-existent middle. There are elements of this that do require you to have things that traverse twins. And I think this is it's all a big balance. So I think that first bit there, where they say interoperability is the central challenge, they're completely right. It's a challenge because you've got to find balance between the thin middle, the, the, the standardization, the, the use cases you have for twins, and how they all interact together. Uh, absolutely. And I think you know, in, in the standards working group, we've sort of said, well, it's, it's too early to create standards, right? But actually, the, the one bit that we, we should is that, because mm. that's the bit that allows twins to find each other and connect to each other. And then, and then you can make an informed view about how you reconcile. But if, it doesn't, if you don't know it's there and you can't even find it and figure out what its purpose is, how could you ever use it? So I think that's, that's yeah, agreed. I really like the uh, idea of focusing on use cases, um, particularly because when you are applying this to industry, it's not just about doing for doing it, it's because you want to get an outcome. So I, I think that uh, the focus that has been discussed, uh, not only in this forum, but different forums, is um, focusing on what you are trying to achieve based on the use cases. And then it, the, that will lead you to what kind of implementation of digital twin uh, you might need to get your outcome. It was in, in one of the sessions I was before. It was asked, uh, "Is this that? Is this a digital twin? Is this a digital model?" Well, and, and the answer or the consensus was, "It doesn't matter. It, it depends on what you are trying to achieve. As long as you get an outcome, um, well, it works." Um, uh, one of the good feedback that I have on these recommendations are um, the cross-domain ontology. Uh, increasingly, the, when we start using digital twin, it's going to get more and more complex for a fact that it's going to interact with multiple systems. So we need to create a system of systems approach and also models-based approach. So it, it will be also good to look at uh, reusability and the reconfigurability of the elements that is sought in building the digital twins too. That's a recommendation that I have. 
brilliant. Thank you. I'd like to open this up to the audience as well. So has anybody in the audience got any views or thoughts that they'd, they'd like to? Or even on, on Slido, because I've got Slido on screen in front of me too. Uh, hi there, uh, Dan, British Standards, top Slido question. Um, it's disappeared from the screen, so I'll try and re-remember what I wrote. Um, in <laughs> several of standards and bits and pieces, there's a, there, there is this idea of an interoperability framework, which I've always found quite interesting. And it's something I've pushed quite a lot, and there are, there are five parts to it, effectively. And, just, and the question, preload before I say what the five are, is do you agree with those five? Um, which is, one is that element of transport. It's the easy one of, you know, do we have the wires, cables, networks to get it from one place to the other? There's syntactic, which typically is where everyone focuses, which is the data structure elements and trying to do the mapping. There's the semantic bit in terms of classification relations to it. But the two that people tend to ignore on the interoperability side, one is the behavioral expectation side. And the example I typically give is, if I say to you, I'm going to give you confidential HR data from my business, you probably immediately think that's going to be people's names, email addresses, date of births, those sorts of things. But if you don't get that, it's failed to meet the expectation So uh, in that way. And the last one is then a policy one where things like GDPR and other things come in whereby you could be interoperable when you exchange information from the US with China, but not when you exchange it between Britain and China. So I'm just asking, wondering, because obviously I've not seen the report or anything, but are all five of those facets a part of that scope when they talk about interoperability, or is it more of a subset? And if it is a subset, do you think it should be broadened into those five? So I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the report either, uh, really. But what I would say is the last two elements you've, you've spoken about are the two that actually we can do something meaningful on. I think, I think it's at a sort of a, a system of systems level. I think I think we need to be very wary of moving into the other three, um, at a, other than within the individual systems. Yeah, I, I mean personally, I, it's it's a difficult one. So the the IMFE is actually quite conceptual, and it's, it's derived from the CDBB's IMF uh, Information Management Framework. It is a very high level sort of approach to looking at things. So I mean. One of the problems we have in the research community is that nobody, even if you're measuring the same thing, talks the same language. So they don't, you know, if you have a temperature in the ocean and, and the temperature in the atmosphere, then they're not necessarily going to be the same temperature because they were measured with different sensors or different approaches to post processing the data. And just so actually in trying to enforce that people start to put that metadata or the necessary metadata and syntax there is really, like, I think that's a really big challenge and I don't think you're realistically going to do that so the only way we can do it and this is where I start to say well actually yeah we do need a framework for measuring interoperability but the very first thing we need to do is give the person the carrot in the first place why do they want to contribute to a twin and make it interoperable in the first place and that's use case driven I think if we go too quickly into the the realm of saying you have to meet these interoperability criteria, then we're going to just turn scientists off because they, they, you know, they'll just, I want to publish my research, I don't want to do anything else. But that's very u research use case driven. Um, well, I, I really like the idea of this framework being um, more open. So it's, it's, it's just, I see it as a general um, recommendation rather than something that it needs to be really strict. And it links to what you were saying about uh, the different types of interoperability, so uh, semantic, syntactic, and cross-functional interoperability. So I think sometimes we focus a lot on syntactic um, interoperability, which is a, a technical problem that has been solved uh, if you only focus on the technical solution. So you already have a lot of standards, XML, um, JSON, uh, a lot of methods to share information. I think the challenge is on the top levels. First, syntactic, making people not just sharing data, but understanding the data or sharing the knowledge. And that is not just between uh, different companies. It happens inside of your own company. If you talk to different people, they think about the digital twin in a different way. And then that leads us to the cross-functional um, idea in which is connecting um, yeah, digital twins in, in a way that all work uh, together. 
I mean, um, just to add to what other three panelists had said, uh, depending on the use case and the domain that where the digital twin is going to operate, it's important to have this five dimensions of the interoperability, but decide which extent of interoperability should exist, very specific to the use case and the domain. Brilliant. Thank you. Going to flip to, there's a couple of questions coming in online, which I'll get to. I'm going to flip straight to a challenges question. So um, what challenges do people see in, in achieving digital twin interoperability? So, and then we'll come to Rob Guthrie's question afterwards. So put it to the panel first. So what challenges do people see in, inter in achieving that? And who am I seeing who's keen? Go for it, Cindy. So uh, <laughs> the credibility of digital twins uh, really lies in two main things. One is on the continuous improvement, and second is on the predictive capability. So the data that flows from a cyber system will come as an information back to the uh, uh, from a sorry, the data that goes from the physical system will come as an information or insights from the cyber system. So. Um, when, when we have this continuous iteration and continuous improvement, the digital twin is not a standalone technology stack at, as it used to be. Considering Ben's example, today we create a digital twin for signaling of the railways. To get the benefit of that, uh, it's important to look at some of the interesting use cases that he mentioned. Like Ben might have a vision to increase the footfall to the railways. He might have to need a better planning. He might have to track the people behavior, that digital twin should also interact with the other systems like Transport for London, for example, or the road planning or the urban planning, for example. So this technology stack of digital twin should evolve coherently with the socio-economic system by itself because to reap the best out of the credibility of the digital twin, it's important that the digital twin evolves in the socio-economic factors too. Uh, meaning that whenever there is a market driver, number of systems that is going to interact with the digital twin is going to increase, and the complexity is also going to increase. So today we implement digital twin. Tomorrow you want to get more insights. There is a possibility that there is an additional system or infrastructure is going to interact. So as this complexity goes, the major bottleneck that that we will we are going to have is the data silos, because there is a chance or there is an existing bottleneck that the data is kind of locked in the legacy systems. The legacy tools are not being able to integrate with the modern tools and technologies. So the main challenge for the interoperability is to deal with the data silos uh, from the different systems, different data sources, or heterogeneity. Uh, to deal that, it's important to have a systems approach uh, to solve this heterogeneous um, environment of data silos. Would anybody else? Anna Sal? No, I, I completely agree on, on the data silos. Um, it happens a lot in, within companies. Uh, so you have a lot of data that it might be legacy data. Uh, you don't know how to incorporate into your current implementation of digital twins. You have people working on different versions of digital twins. So for example, you can have a digital twin thinking about physical infrastructure, but then you have someone else thinking of a digital twin in terms of energy consumption. So um, the idea, or, or one of the challenges, I think, is how we can connect all of those different versions of the same digital twin, perhaps if you are working in the same company, or if you are looking at sharing that with other companies. So how we can make that uh, a common language for everyone to share uh, just this, the en enough uh, amount of information so that they can work all together. I think that's one of the big challenges. The other one is governance. So how we are going to deal with data internally. So who is going to be responsible of what once you have the digital twin working? And that leads to also security. So how are we going if to, are, if we are talking about uh, infrastructure, and if particularly if we are talking about critical infrastructure, so, so how we are going to make sure that all of that is secure? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you, governance is definitely one of the biggest problems here, I think, uh, with all of this. And, and it is it's wrapped up with federation as well. 
of the whole idea of interoperability across twins and especially across organizations and, and research domains and all of, all of it. We want federation and we want, uh, you know, we want all of these things to be interoperable, but the federation is not a licked problem. You know, we, we know how to, you know, as evidenced here, we know how to build fairly effective digital twins already, like from a technological standpoint. So we're not dealing with technical challenges. But actually, getting everyone able to, you know, log in to the same twin to have a go, like, requires them to independently register. That's another identity. So what, there's no federation structures that encompass the whole of the UK, let alone the whole of, of the globe. And I think that ties up with the governance thing. There's no common governance model that people are following at the moment. Mm. I think if we get that, maybe it will help. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so. We did some work with the data sharing group to try and understand this this question of what are the what are the big problems really and how do the problems relate to each other. So what are the, the problems of problems, the systemic interaction of problems, um, which I think will be published on the if you went at the session earlier that that'll be published with all the content that comes out of out of the summit today. Uh, it's kind of a problem space map, like a graph, simple graph database, um, and, and that uncovered some interesting some interesting things. I think that the, the key things there there was a there's kind of a perpetual proliferation of point solutions. That goes on because you know it's hard and difficult to create an integrated solution and it's expensive, so therefore I deploy a point solution. But then because I've deployed a point solution, I've made it hard for anybody else to create an integrated solution. So so the, we keep adding to this problem of complexity and legacy solutions and making it harder and harder to get an integrated semantic approach to anything. Um, so there's 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 sort of that. That's one of the key challenges. Um, there's a, a challenge around uh, sort of the, the 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 rights management, stakeholder management. Uh, and, and, and how those two things interact with each other and business cases. And there's kind of a, an iron triangle there of, of, of three things that all trade off against each other. And actually, it's really hard to figure out how you resolve those things in any given situation. Um, so that there's that aspect. And there's a problem of leadership uh, as well, which I've talked about at length. So I'm not going to get off my chest again today. Um, so so, so there's, there's those three key those three key areas, I think. But I think, I think overall, I'd say the... The big biggest problem of all is is these, this is it's revolutionary. It, it, it's going to fundamentally change how we do so many things, which means it fundamentally changes the balance of power in any given organisation deploying these solutions. Uh, which means there are many many people who will have uh, who will have real reasons not to want to do it, uh, and consequently they will find good reasons as alibis for not doing it. So, going to pick one of the questions from the slider now. And it kind of continues on this governance discussion. I pointed it to one question. I pointed the question to one person, so I hope they've had a chance to think. So the panel's working slightly on their feet here, so we may get slightly slower answers. We're going to go for this question from Rob Guthrie, which is connected twins hinge on a clear understanding of what needs to be shared. How do you gather the information requirements needed between twins? Sure. Um, um, I think it's a good question. Um, it's important to know what needs to be shared between digital twins. I think it really boils down to what you want to get from connecting two digital twins really, right? Um, what is the use case that you're behind? And, um, and uh, once you arrive at the use case, you should have two approaches again. The top-down approach on what is the technology architecture side of things, what are the elements on the technology side. And another is on the bottom-up approach on what kind of business models you're looking at, what is the socio-economic impact that you're looking at. So probably with these two approach, and again, on the, with the use case that, that, that is needed out of connecting these digital twins, I think probably that's a fair way to arrive at what needs to be connected between two digital twins. Just to build on this, I mean, it comes to this governance structure again, right? So, I mean, if you build two independent twins and then want to connect them together, if you've done that with a responsible shared governance model, then it should be baked in that the two can interoperate in some way. There might be, you know, that you might have a, user, a dedicated user interface or another tool, but like you say, it derives from the use case that you should be able to connect them if they're on a responsible governance model. Sorry, there was there was a very interesting point in the other slide, the one you had with the um, outcome of, of the workshop, that was focused on gathering user needs from the beginning. So I think that's also something that it's important when we are considering the whole picture. Uh, sometimes we focus on creating this magic um, solution 
that will solve all the problems within the company. And we think that it will work. But actually, when you present this to the, the end users, they think, well, no, this is not what I had in mind. So I think this is also part of the input that you need to take into consideration when you are trying to create this um, connectivity between different versions of or different ideas of, of your digital twin um, to create this inter interoperability. Sorry to add, I mean, it's, it's the, it comes back to the, the two bits of standardization that we can standardize are the two that will help solve that problem. I'm going to go to the most, I'm going to, I'm going to go with the votes this time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look at the top question. Um, I'm going to say it, read it really slowly so you've got a chance to think. <laughs> so is scalability of the model, breadth and capacity a concern in the current discussion in the interoperability framework? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's the problem. We've got, we, you know, uh, we've got to do this for the whole National Rail Network, right? And we've got future transport zones springing up that are doing it in their little world. And you know, proliferation of point solutions again. Jesus, how, how are we going to integrate these things? Who else is on the hook to integrate them? Nobody. OK, great. You know, it becomes our problem uh, to solve these things. Uh, when we're ready to admit that, we'll, we'll probably get on with it. Um, I would like to pick an example to answer this question. Um, just consider that we are creating a digital twin of a robotic arm in a manufacturing factory. The complexity is going to be simple, like you will know a set, set of definite unknowns and knowns, and you will probably create a data, um, data pipeline and a model pipeline, and you will achieve a feedback back to the physical world, and you will feel like, hey, I have di achieved digital twin, and it's going to be possible. But when you actually go, to, go on implementing a digital twin for the whole factory floor or for the whole built-in environment, just imagine the complexity that's going to be there. Your data sources yeah. itself is going to be sitting in silos. You will have to deal with the vendor lock-ins. You will have to sort out your IT infrastructure. You will have to sort out the enterprise IT interoperability and the five set of uh, five four set of interoperability elements. So always scalability and flexibility should be accounted when you want to create a digital twin of an ecosystem, and uh, that should be accounted when you do a proof of concept itself. Just, I think I'll add, I'll add slightly on onto that as well, and maybe playing a little bit of de devil's advocate actually is that I think I think when we talk about defining a framework for interoperability, we we should actually not worry as much about breadth and scale, uh, breadth and capacity of a digital twin, because the problem is is that you you know as we've seen with technology over decades now we will meet technical challenges to some degree. So if you've got a data lake, let's say, for one twin that is you know, taking in everything from an organization, then you want to couple it to a Royal Mail twin. Uh, sorry, Royal Mail? Network Rail. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to couple those two things together, then the methods by which we make the twin scalable for interoperability's sake are maybe not as relevant. They are in, with respect to having the Network Rail twin, and building it so that you can absorb all of that data into the lake and build your tools and systems on it. But yeah. the interoperability has to be by design for the sake of interoperability, not for the design of scaling the interoperability tool up. You do that so, when you have a tool in But yeah, anyway. Yeah. So, so I think, I think there's a, it's a question of the, the interoperability. The, so the, it's not the technical aspect of it. It's, it's the, the scale that lets the business case, that lets the outcome be served, which lets the business case be served. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then that justifies the whole thing. And, yeah. and, and it's how you make that journey. Because until, you know, until Mrs. Miggins can tap in at Land, Land's End and tap out again at John O'Groats when she goes to visit her sister, mm. um, and those are both at local bus stations, and it could be any given bus stop anywhere, um, nobody can, you know, it's all got to work electronically behind the scenes, because no bus driver could possibly know where she was going to in some obscure location. So it's all got a, the amount of different systems we have to integrate to make that work. Yeah. And the ability or the challenge of compartmentalizing the system so we can integrate gradually yeah. is really difficult. So it's how, how do you, it'd be insane to do it in a big bang, but actually how do you not do it in a big bang? Well, it becomes a really, you select your, you select your yeah. use cases though. Yeah. Right? I it, think that's the important thing, isn't it? Though? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe, don't yeah. know. That, that's the challenge. The, cha the challenge is, is a, is a logist logistical, organisational, and buy-in one. It's not a technical one, really. The technical challenges are all eminently surmountable. Yeah, yeah. I got the signal from Cindy, so I'm guessing you. 
I'm okay with it. Yes, I, I agree. <laughs> we agree to seek a secret sing the signal if they want to talk. <laughs> um, so there's a bit of a devil's advocate question. I don't know whether it takes us back to governance on here, but do we need to explicitly define all of this? Why can't we just find the core percent LNM? I don't know that acronym, sorry. And use that to generate the specs. Does anyone know? Yeah. Yeah, large language models. Yeah, large, okay. large language models are a big part of the part of the solution potentially to this. I totally agree uh, to help us fix the semantic problem. And, and yeah, if you can solve the ontological or, or the semantic problem, then that that disrupts that core problem of deploying point solutions. So it, that, that's one of the ways of solving the fundamental cycle of doom that we're in. Um, but it doesn't solve the other cycles, which we know are problems as well. So it only solves some of the problems. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, yeah, the LLM could be a really good tool. The problem is having the corpus. So having the data, the correct data, because at the moment everyone thinks like you go to ChatGPT and you will get the right answer, and that's not correct. You get an answer, but is it correct or not? You need to assess that answer. So it depends on the data again. Um, if you have that right corpus, then LLM would be like really a very useful tool for moving forward towards an, an, a framework <coughs> and interoperability of digital tools. But then <coughs> how we get that corpus uh, and we make sure that is uh, something that we can use. Yeah, I and mean, some of this stuff is safety critical as well, which is where it will end up. Well, at, at what point are you going to be willing to trust safety critical data to a, to a, a black box AI system? That's but, scary stuff. And this, this takes in ethical concerns as well. It was raised in the last session about the problem with LLMs is that, you know, we just have, yeah, they, they currently fire back, they're like a reflection of the internet, which is, let's face it, not a particularly lovely thing to have reflected back at you at any time. So um, LLMs are part of the solution for the lower hanging fruit of problems, maybe. But not all of them. Not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got one more question from the line, um, from Rob again. How much do you find that technology limits? Uh, sorry, how much does how much do you find some limitations within an organisation constrain the capability of digital twin and its connectivity to other twins? And how do you overcome this? So it's, it's effectively how do we overcome technological technology limitations of our twins internally? So I think it re really depends on the technology and individual organization you belong, uh, right? When you want to create a digital twin for the industry and then make a feedback control, it depends on your IT framework, OTIT convergence, and then, uh, and, and again, boils down to the use case, what do you want to achieve again? But uh, it's important to look at the convergence and policies of your own organization when you want to achieve this. And how do you overcome this is to have um, have a good framework, have right skill sets, um, and importantly, have uh, thought about human centric centricity in the use case approach for the digital twins. Um, no, I, I agree. I mean, having a set of um, something that you can guide on um, as a framework is is definitely needed. Is and I think it's something that the digital twin hub is working, um, putting a lot of effort with all the different working groups, uh, trying to get this interoperability between, and again, the word interoperability, between all the groups that look at different angles of um, what do we need for having a digital twin. It's not just the technical aspect, it's also governance, it's also digital skills, uh, it's also, um, well, yeah, how we, convey this message to stakeholders. So it, it, it has a lot of different aspects that they need to be tackled. From, yeah, from the perspective of BAS, I mean, technology, uh, technology limitations, it sort of goes back to what you were saying a minute ago, Ben, about um, safety concerns as well, and you know, ethical concerns, the whole issue of LLMs. I mean, BAS is a research organization. We're one of many research organizations. We don't have endless budgets, and we're not a startup. So we can't wipe our infrastructure out and build it all up again, ready for digital twinning. Um, and we have to operate a very safety critical operation. Uh, you know, we run planes and uh, bases and the like. We have to take care of the people within the organization first. And that also includes the people who have 
professions within that organisation that can't necessarily be replaced by decision-making tools. So, um, and we don't want to replace people with decision-making tools. We want to give them aids to do their job better. Um, so I think the technology limitation is only a, a part of it. There is a, there is a portion there where, we, like I say, we can't just start again with a, a nice big several million pound budget and just replace everything. And we don't have the staff to do it anyway, much as we would maybe sometimes like to. But, the, um, but yeah, the technology limitation can be a problem, but it's not an insurmountable problem. It will happen gradually. And at the same time, we need to also address the, the, the more... The, yeah. the, the ethical side of it and the, the responsible side of it. So we have a lot of trouble with legacy systems. Uh, <coughs> we've got systems that we dare not turn off, really. They're safety critical systems we've run in the railway for a long time. It takes a lot of courage to replace that and turn that off. Uh, but we need to, because although they're not broken, they're making it harder for us to improve and harder for us to improve. Uh, we've got the proliferation of point solutions that goes on because everybody wants to save a bit of money, you get pressure, pressure to reduce costs drives this point solution solve individual problems so that I've, I've, which I've touched on already so there's there's that whole aspect um, then there's a I mean Rob I imagine is coming at it from from more sort of research oriented perspective uh, so I think it's, it's some extent it's more the, sort of the knowledge limitations the, the further out technologies and I think there we've we've got a problem that we we're reliant on proprietary systems far too much uh, there there isn't enough open openly available knowledge base, you know, the, I mean, the, what, what, are, what are the standards for interoperability when you're exchanging information about, about bits of railway? It's a, it's a rail sys model, which is a proprietary modeling system. Um, so, so actually there, there are some challenges there that of, of lacking some of the standard taxonomies to allow us to exchange with anyway. Uh, so I think there's, there's that aspect to it. And then there's, there's the lack of understanding of the, of the interaction, that sort of the, the gap between social sciences and, and engineering sciences is, is, is a key challenge for us as well, because actually we really need to have better numerical and computer, computational understanding of uh, economic and social impact. Um, and actually being able to turn those economic and social impact bits of information into usable heuristics, or, 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 or if we can't get real numbers, at least usable heuristics that we can feed into and use to design and develop and build with. Brilliant, thank you. So I'm going to finish with one last very short question, one sentence answer. What do you feel is the most valuable use case to kind of go forward with and why in one sentence, and then we'll bring it to a close? Sorry, what's the question? The most valuable use case to pursue with interoperability and why? Just one, one sentence. The most valuable use case uh, for, for pursuing interoperability is to achieve data interoperability between systems in an organization or in an ecosystem to construct connected digital twins. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, well, if we go to the idea of the general idea of interoperability is not about just technology or data. It's also systems and processes. Processes involve humans as well. So for me, it's also including people into all the idea of the interoperability, how they, what the, the role they have and how we are going to help them to fulfill that role. Brilliant. Can you repeat the question? No, I'm only joking. In one sentence. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Um, no, can the, um, it's giving people effective tools for effective policy making is the most important thing. So I think it's socioeconomic models on geospatial models and making those two things work together, because then we can do all sorts of stuff in built environment, in transport. It'll, you know, it'll allow us to just join a lot of stuff up. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you. I just want to close by saying thank you to our panel. I know you've had to think really hard on your feet and some very difficult questions. And also thank you to DT Hub for making this possible, because it's, they've been amazing. Without them, this would not have happened. <laughs>